80 million people in the world stutter. That's one in 100 people stutter. And you probably know somebody that does. Hi, I'm Rich Bontrager, and welcome to Beyond the Stutter, Family, Identity, and Courage. It's part of the International Stutter Awareness Day, taking place today, October 22nd. Yeah, 80 million people around the world stutter. And did you know that there's no cure? There's no pill, there's no shot, there's nothing that can be done to really cure a stutter. And yet, people have done amazing things with their lives and careers besides having a stutter. We all learn our own tips, our own tricks. And tonight, it's going to be a very special night. You're going to go around the world with me and meet interesting people that will share openly about the troubles, the pains, the laughter, the teasing, and the great accomplishments that they've achieved with a stutter. Tonight, Sandra D. Robinson will join us as a special reporter, and she will do an in-depth probe of my life as a stutterer, and we'll have my family join us as well. So sit back and relax for the next hour, and join us as we go beyond the stutter with family, identity, and courage. I have gotten to the point where I pursue confidence over fluency. I pursue what is functional over fluency, and the rest takes care of itself. Uh, but you also now have a mission to help yes. others discover their greatness. And one of the people this week said, I never thought my stutter would be my superpower. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that, man. As you said, I've been stuttering for 25 years now. And during that stint of time, you know, I've seen me grow as a person when it comes to work as well, too. You know, as someone that lives with a lifelong stutter, I'm always learning from other people how they manage their stutter. Actor Samuel L. Jackson went through a horrible childhood and stuttered so much, he almost didn't speak for a whole year in school. He was bullied, he was picked on, he was harassed, it was horrible. He slowly began to learn different techniques and one of the ways that he found by himself was by swearing. The F-bomb is his favorite word and Samuel says it helps break the rhythm that's gonna cause the loop, the stuttering loop. By dropping in the F-bomb, he resets himself and he's able to move forward and more smoothly. I suggest that you try different things. Experiment. See what works for you. Not everything is a simple answer. You might find a unique and simple solution for yourself. And like Samuel, it may become your signature mark. While there is no cure for a stutter, there are four common themes that reoccur over and over again through scientific studies. One, genetics. 60% of those that stutter also have a family member that stutters. Trauma is another one that often reoccurs that somewhere early in life, there was a traumatic event, especially for children, and children will have a stutter early on. Early on means, yes, it does fade with time and it may dissipate altogether, but trauma is one of those areas that can trip up a stutter. Neurological studies have been done. Somewhere there's a disconnect in our mind and our mouth and the stutter comes out. Family dynamics. Family dynamics often play into it. Somehow it's a family doesn't pay too much attention to a child. Somewhere there's a high pressure family that's putting too much pressure on the child. Family dynamics has a lot to do with stuttering, they think, and it plays out throughout their entire life. By the way, I was four for four on that growing up as a kid. Yes, I had all four of those characteristics play into my stutter. And with that, we have a lot of troubles that come our way because of stuttering. You know, the journey of my uh, life in Canada started when I was 10 years old. And um, I remember the teacher had asked me to share how I immigrated to Canada. And I was 10 years old. English wasn't my first language. And, you know, when you're 10, you don't really care. So you get up on front of the class and start talking. And, you know, I just got up there and started speaking. And, a couple of kids started laughing. 
I'm like, okay, weird. And then one kid yelled, go back to where you came from. Wow. And I didn't really know what that meant at that point. But I knew what laughter meant. Yeah. And then a couple of them started saying, go back to where you came from again, and more laughter. I kind of looked at the teacher. I said, what's... He said, I don't know. He kind of shrugged his shoulders, and he didn't know what to do. So I tried to continue, but I couldn't. So I got off, got off the front of the class and went and sat in my chair. And then the life of Licky with a stutter started. Went through high school, getting bullied because of the stutter, because of the color of my skin, because of my name. It wasn't easy. Uh, by grade 10, there was too many fights. I got in the wrong, some bad, wrong habits at that point. And by grade 11, I couldn't take the bullying anymore. So I quit school. I dropped out of high school. So you asked me about my college career. I didn't really have one. I mean, I remember times when it was bad. And I mean, you just couldn't get to stop. There, there was no way. And um, uh, Because you talk about your low self-esteem directly is connected to the stuttering back when you were a kid, correct? That's what I, that's what I felt. Yeah. My low self-esteem and the inner fear that I felt that I wasn't even aware of that it was living in my subconscious. Wow. Now well, we're going to mind that because I can relate to that, but <laughs> also during your tech talk, you mentioned, and if I heard you right, you also had a weight gain and you kind of connected weight gain and stuttering together. Is that accurate? Everything is linked. So my low self-confidence, my a lot of the fear and everything like this was linked to my weight gain. So I, I didn't know, but I was trying to numb my emotions, my feelings, my anxiety, my low self-confidence uh, and my anxiety with eating. See, and that's the first time I've ever heard that directly linked to stuttering and the whole self-esteem stuff. I've never heard anyone specifically say, I ate to cover it up or I ate to lose myself. What, what really went on with that and how, how far did that eating habit go? It was fun. <laughs> I was the best <laughs> fat kid. So I had done every diet under the sun. I, had done, I was the best. I knew every fat diet. I knew you know, all the latest information around dieting. I even had weight loss surgery, not once, but twice. Wow. Right. Did you did did you see my stutter impact me with different people within my family at all? I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. How did that impact me? Do you think? I mean, I think, what, I think what kind you of... were you were spent a lot of your time withholding, withholding who you really could be. I think you you knew who you were inside. You did not know how or didn't have the ability at a young age to express it. But. The, the, the entire stuttering started to define me after age 13 when there was this huge event in my life. My mom left Liberia. She had to leave because of political, you know, travel, mm -hmm. all those kind of things that don't fit, that, that a child would never understand. And I just went down here for that. I totally forgot that I started for the first 12 years of my life. You know, mom around, wow. mom holds in your hand, in holds in her hand your, you know, self-esteem, your self-belief. Each morning you get up, my, my mom is there, I'm fine. Now she's not there, you know, my, my entire life, and I allow it to be defined by stuttering. And your first seizure was in Sturdy Oaks. Yep. When you ran into the fence. Running down the hill with all the gang, and, and I go plowing into it. Where, I th maybe first grade. That was six, seven years old. Yep. Yeah, and I don't, th I don't know if you stuttered before that. Oh, now that's an interesting. I don't know, but I you because know. they say traumatic events is one of the four traumatic events. Often I get asked by people, "What does it feel like to stutter?" Feeling, it's a really complicated area that we have to go within ourselves and often we can't even share with you what it really feels like to stutter. We have ideas, we have our dreams and we just can't get them out. So first of all, feelings are very personal to us. We want to understand, we want to share, but we just can't get it out because we stutter. Then you have the feelings of your family members. 
you have feelings from those who are trying to express their empathy, their concern. They just don't understand, and they get that awkward feeling of what I do for you. How can I help you? And then stutters have to deal with the feelings that we take home from being bullied, picked on, ridiculed, teased, and just not understood. Feelings. That's a whole mess when it comes to stuttering. Yeah, The inner stutter is a term that I absolutely love. And more and more as I'm talking, sharing, I'm reflecting on what that inner, the inner stutter felt like. So what were some of those things? What would be some examples you can give? So I was, I was never going to be like other kids. I am not deserving. I am stupid. I am ugly. Um, I am, you know, and the list went on. I couldn't express myself. Um, yeah. Those were my inner stutters. Like those were the things that were really holding me back. So I, of, I, often, I often thought it was my stutter, but then when I started to re reflect inwardly, it wasn't my stutter, but it was my inner stutter. So when you began to figure this out, how old were you when you first started to really figure out the inner stutter? Uh, when I figured that out, I was, um, I just had my first child. So I was around 30. Was there ever a point that you said, this is me? I mean, that was really hard for me. That was really hard for a long time. I would pretend to be somebody else. Uh, I didn't want to be rich because rich was connected to the stutter. I was bullied. I was nicknamed. But in my mind, I had to become somebody else. And I wouldn't accept me for me. Was, was that part of your journey? Yeah, for sure, Rich. You have to understand that. When you don't feel good about yourself and you don't think you're good enough, you lean on others to make you feel better. And then you lean on other people or the friends or the family members and when they don't show it to you then you feel worthless Green, for those that don't understand the power of the stutter it really does oh it, it impacts us when we stutter we know what we want to say but the words are stuck between here and here and you get the looks and you see people get nervous for you now, i don't know about you but that was one of the worst parts i was like i'm going to get through this i don't like it but i will but when i saw other people get worried for me it made it worse. Did that would, did that happen for you? Oh, for sure. They would finish my sentences for me. They would finish the conversation. And yeah, that look of, oh, no, are you okay? <laughs> and um, they, meant, they meant well by it, for sure. They did. Uh, yeah. However, it didn't help me at all. Yeah. Is, there's a difference between self-esteem, confidence, and self-image. <laughs> Pretty much self-esteem is how we feel about ourselves. Confidence is completely situational. Mm -hmm. But self-esteem deep, not self-esteem, self-image completely controls everything. And when we, like, for a long time, I will refer to myself as a stutterer. That was your label. That, 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 label. that totally defined you. That's the identity. And the meaning that identity kicks in, it's hard to get past it. There were times I would even, you know, be on stage and I would tell people, hey, I've given myself permission to stutter. I gave you permission to laugh, be uncomfortable, whatever emotion you choose to feel. Yes. Now, because I started to, there's this thing I learned, Rich. It not only accept me, but embrace me. Well, that's what a lot of people think. They think stutters are, I'm just going to say, stupid. We don't have the brains. We don't have the brilliance. When in fact, your story alone proves it. But many others, we're highly intelligent. The problem is we can't get it from here to here. Correct. And the, the primary reason was because we was we had this whole you know while well, our focus was on everybody else and what everybody else thought yes. and how we stuck up with that cool guy who could just say what he wants to say who could just go up to the girl in high school and talk and, and you standing there hello my 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 name is Patrick <laughs> you know <laughs> we wanted to be that well. And that's a great illustration because a lot of time we do feel we're in the groove. Everything's cool. 
And a moment later, we cannot get that one or two words out. And it unravels us, Goes but also ahead. it unravels the people around us, doesn't it? It's, and the, that's the thing, because nobody knows how to react. And in my case, a lot of people you, you run into are speech therapy. Everybody is a speech therapy. Everybody has stuttered before, and they, will, they can tell you, okay, how to behave. <laughs> I'm like, don't you know that I know this <laughs> and I've tried this all these years? <laughs> Do you know that Emily Blunt, the actress from the movie Fall Guy, lives with a lifelong stutter? She lives with a stutter, but she's learned how to manage it. And here's three easy ways that Emily does that. She's learned how to act and do role playing. At about age 12, she was encouraged to try doing accents and voices and act. And the stutter began the lesson. She's also had a very supportive family environment. Family and friends don't laugh or ridicule or worry about her stutter. Rather, they encourage her to just be her. And finally, she's learned relaxation tips. One of the big things about stuttering is we often get worried. And the more frustration, the more we stutter. She's learned techniques to just relax, breathe through it, and move on. And by the way, Emily Blunt says she's not cured. She just learned how to manage it better. What about you? Which one of these tips? might help you with your stutter. One of the hardest things for a stutter is to remove all the obstacles and let you see them for who they really are. Very often, we are misunderstood. We're labeled very early on as being stupid, dumb, slow, and many other things. It's extremely painful, but not just that. These labels put obstacles in front of us. If only you knew how smart we really were. In this section, we're going to dive a little bit deeper inside the obstacles that stutterers face and who we really are. As we say, get inside journey in the life of a stutter. So, and most people do not understand the inner journey of a stutter. Uh, yes. As we were talking before we rolled the tape, we're stupid, we're idiots, we're slow learners, but they don't understand what's really going on, do they? No. And it's actually the opposite. What I found is that a lot of these, a lot of us stutterers, we're stuttering because our mind is thinking at a lot faster pace. So you found that too. I, it, it took me years to figure that out. Uh, I had no formal therapy, but I finally figured out, and I talk about this openly now, the information in my head wanted to get out faster than my tongue could keep up with the information. So yes. it was tripping over this. And I yes. talk about now getting into sync and the rhythm. And when I found that rhythm, that sync, it opened up a whole new world for me. Did you find the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Once I synced up and just really paused to really understand, you know, and really sync it up, that was a big difference for me. But I also found that a lot of these people are intelligent. They're not stupid. <laughs> so recently, I, I, as part of the series... My father and I were talking about that. They tried to put me in the special ed. They tested me out. I was yeah. too smart for special ed, but too dumb to be in school. And uh, my father said, well, What I remember is when they came to the house afterwards. Okay? Oh, I don't remember that. They, they'd gotten all their, you know, they'd gone through the, all the stuff. And they came in and literally spread out on the, on the floor the paperwork and stuff. <laughs> okay. I think there's a genius there. The question is, can you open it up? And a lot, a, a lot of stutters talk about when they finally figure out what's going on. They talk about their the words are caged, the creative ideas are caged, but they can't get it out of this little funnel of a mouth. Yes, and it's frustrating to not be able to tell people, "I got it all right here." But I just can't get it past here. Was was that one of your biggest frustrations growing up? Yeah, expressing expressing myself. I couldn't express of how I felt, if I felt angry, if I felt frustrated, if I had a really good answer in 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 the classroom and the teacher was asking the students. Uh, I often felt that I had a really bright answer, and then I just it, it was that moment of speaking, and then I couldn't speak, and it was better not to speak rather than feel humiliated. So can so you I explain that? For, yeah, yeah just, just go further. Explain that feeling of I'm trapped in my own mouth. Yeah. What's that I feeling will, like? 
just like what you said, you just feel trapped. You feel like you're in shackles. You feel like you're in your own prison and no one understands what you're going through. No one can understand and hear you. It's like trying to scream underwater. Oh, I like that. So what was your family's reaction? Because this was something that they apparently either weren't aware of or was this a surprise or was this something mom and dad were aware of but, but never really had brought up to you? Well, it was just mom and my two brothers at that point, And it really wasn't evident to my close people because when I was with them, I was comfortable and the stutter wasn't always there. However, when I got into a new environment or forget public speaking. <laughs> I know, <laughs> that was never going to happen, all right? Well, no, but part of our, our, our traditions and our religion, we have an opportunity to speak in front of our, uh, our group and I remember speaking in front of them once and I stuttered right through it and I never went back on there again and did it. You know, when it comes to stuttering, did you have it from childbirth on? Did something trigger mm -hmm. your stutter? Because some people do have a traumatic event and mm -hmm. it kicks in. How, how did yours come about? As far as I can remember, it started when I was five and one of my best friends in elementary school stuttered. So we would hang out all the time and I would start copying him. I don't know if it was intentionally or I was just picking up, up things that he was doing, but that might have been it. But also at birth, I was a triplet and I was the only one who survived. And there were a lot of complications when it came to me from the birth. So that might have. The, the fact that you decided to come out of the office and onto the floor and intentionally engage people, mm -hmm. that's pretty bold. How did the people first respond when you came down and stumbled and bumbled and had that time? What was the reaction from them? It definitely took tough skin. You know, manufacturing is a very hard environment, you know, and um, it took me a while to really get comfortable, but I kind of just let it all hang out. You know, you get so tired of trying to hide it and things like that. So once you just come out, <laughs> with it it kind of it doesn't really matter the reaction of what the other side is it's like okay well it's out there now so much better so i get the degree apply for roles i'm not getting the roles rich i'm like <laughs> what's happening i apply for something that i'm way over qualified and they say you are way over qualified i apply for something i'm qualified I'm not getting anything. I apply for something that I'm, you know, slightly above my pay grade. You, you, you want to take the risks? I get it. Then this one time, there was a friend of mine who was on the interview panel. He's a manager. And he called me aside. He said, you didn't get that role, that particular one, because the panel was worried that your stuttering would get in the way. Yes. Imagine that, Rich. How it, it, you know, it's like somebody took a knife and just hit it right in your soda plex. Yes, been there. And many stutters, that is the wall, that is the block to get to where they want to get to. Yes. But you got there somehow because look at you, you have a career, you're a businessman, you're a consultant, you because, speak. Because right after that, I said, I've had enough. Let somebody else worry about it. I mean, those words, let someone else worry about it. I, I was so frustrated. I was so, I, I was so demoralized that I'm like, I've had it. Yeah. I am done shaming myself because every night you come home, guys, I stutter. I started oh. with this person. I can't even call my own name. After that, I'm like, I'm done. 
let somebody else worry about it. And that is how everything, it, 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 you know, it was like life started to unfold. You know, people ask, Rich, why are you so concerned about stuttering? If you don't know it, I've lived with a lifelong stutter all my life. And it's been something that's limited me and impacted me dramatically, especially as a young child through high school. When this section of International Stutter Awareness Day, Sandra D. Robinson, actress, talk show host, is going to step into the microphone and we're going to share the behind the scenes story of Trigger. You're going to hear from my family, my friends, and the impact it really had on me. And we're going to get deeply personal about the life of a stutter and how it impacts, hurts, and even the closest, dearest friends and family can cut you the most. Here's Senator D. Robinson. Go back to your family, as you said. Who in your family also stuttered? My mom stutters, and to this day, it's far worse than me. Uh, I, I've learned skills, coping mechanisms, different tricks, no yeah. formal speech therapy, but my mom still stutters, and she has those hard, like, K's and R's, so when she's stuck on a word, she won't give up on it. I will edit and redo my sentence and make it flow in the moment. She will make sure she fights for it. So it started small, but it got very awful. Uh, in elementary school, I didn't stutter much. And so what happened is I was labeled different. And when all the other kids went to art class or music class or fun class, I went to speech therapy class, starting in about third grade. By the time I got to high school, I could hardly speak. And my parents sent me to a professional speech Hello. therapist. And he was wonderful. And he interviewed me. And after an hour, he told me when I stuttered, why I stuttered, and what I could do about it. So at this point, when you're hosting shows, you've obviously, you know, got this fluidity about your speech. Does it just, do you just want to help her? Do you just want to give her, or is she not open to that? No, she's not. It's my mother. It's family, uh, I'm, right? I am still little Richie. Um, and I will always be a little Richie, but that's that's part of it is but she also has come to, as we've talked about this week, she accepts it. It's who she is. Ellen stutters, and people have to get used to it because Ellen's just going to fight for it. Do you think, and you've probably covered it this week, do you think this is something that is that anyone can get over if they want to no. get over? If they don't want to accept it, is it something that can be, do you say, do you say cured? Uh, no. There, A, there is no cure. That's documented. There's no pill. There's no nothing. There are therapies and tricks that can help people, I know, but yeah. stuttering is pretty much with you. So I don't know. I, I wonder if you don't read and stutter, Perhaps there is a way to, you know, to work around that. And you've certainly found the, the way to do it. You know, you but, found the way to do it. Like you said, if I if I hit something, then I just find another word. Yeah. Right, right. This is editing all the time. People have no idea. This is editing, cut and pasting, and I'll make it fluid and make it come out. Most people do not know I was going to stutter. I was beginning to stutter and I've got around it. Now, going back to reading, yeah. when I grew up. I had to read out loud in class, stand up and read the sure. run Dick Jane and all that good stuff. I would cry. I would begin to kick in. The kids literally in the room, in the moment, whisper. And Bomb Booger, Bon Rager, Butt Rager, they made all these names up because I couldn't speak like the way they could. Kids My grammar. Cruel, right? What? Kids oh. can be pretty cruel. It, it, was, it was cruel. I would come home crying very often on the bus because the whole way in, the whole way out, I was the butt of every joke. B -b 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 bond trigger uh and it went on and on and my parents at some levels understood it at some levels they didn't because it was big boys don't cry buckle up come on just be a kid it's not that bad they're just teasing you to have fun and believe me anyone that's gone through that it's not teasing yeah, yeah. bullying is not it's not fun and so when it came to the reading side it was my grandmother who literally sat me down i have very vivid memories of me in the front parlor with my grandmother. I'm a big comic book fan. Fantasy was probably my way to escape from yeah. my reality. And she said, open up your comic and read it out loud. And there's those little bubble things, you know, God. But she said, do it in your voices. So 
So I was Batman. I was Superman. I was Robin. She would have me change my voices. And when I became a character, when I began to fall in love with the, the book, the stutter went away. Do you remember grandma having me go over to her place alone? Mom or dad would drop me off and grandma would have let me read comic books out loud, but she made me do the voices because we found out by me doing voices and characters, I could step on my stutter better. And she allowed me to do Batman, to do Superman. I remember on the kitchen table, I would do voices and would piss everybody off to do Saturday morning cartoons. So but for her, it helped me read better. Do you remember any of that time that I went through that with her? I have no recollection of you in the comic books and grandma. Now that you mentioned, I had a little bit of a recollection of around the dinner table of you doing, like you said, Saturday morning, you know, um, cartoon voices or whatever. And I no recollection, you know, why you were doing it. Um, yeah. But now that you're piecing it together, that that helped you to speak and get away from the stutter. Right. And that was one of the early tricks that I learned that my imagination is part of my cure. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. That's very, very cool. All right. Um, now, speaking, we're still talking about your family. You mentioned your grandmother yeah. and your grandfather was a senator. Yeah. Right. And there were lawyers in your family as well. Was it your father? My, my dad was a lawyer and a judge. And two brothers that were high achievers academically. So did that increase the pressure <laughs> on you? Did that make things worse? Because I mean, anxiety will make the stuttering worse, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Right. So well, how, it, how did that affect you? Well, it's anxiety, but it is a family dynamic. Studies show that family dynamics play into it. So because mine were highly influential, very strong, confident men, brainiacs. Like when I went to high school, uh, I got into the physics class. And literally the expectation was I was going to be like my older brother, Dan, who all-star American, brainiac. And early on, I found out, Rich ain't the same kid that Dan is. <laughs> He's not going to figure out physics. Now, but it did impact my stuttering. It impacted that conference because there was this expectation and I was okay being the fun-loving, playful, imaginary guy, but they wanted me to be something else. Many of them had that preconceived idea. Right. And it did impact my stutter. It did impact that confidence of walking into the room. And my mind's already thinking, they've already met three of my cousins. <laughs> they know who my dad is and my grandfather. Whew. And it messed me up. So when you were getting bullied, I put my hand up when you mentioned that it's not easy. Did your family tell you the right thing when you get minded? Did your no. family tell you the right thing when you were getting bullied? How no. did you get through it? No, because I was also deaf in one ear. I had bad eyesight. So my eyes sometimes, I'm looking at you, but my eyes will go someplace else. So I literally was a very interesting guy to turn around and talk to. And, and I know people have said, where are you looking, man? And oh. then I had my head cocked like this when I was a kid. I, I've learned to overcompensate with the earring now. But there were all these things going against me. So the bowling was really heavy. I, what I remember is it just made you an easier target for other things. Like, you remember clodhoppers. Well, we all wore the clodhoppers. Yeah. But why right. did they rag you so much more than the rest of us? Well, they had the in already with the stuttering. And then you were self-conscious, so that makes you an easier target. That's how I remembered it. Wow, that's another memory. I totally forget about clodhoppers. But there was, you did use me as a stepping stool for your for you being and looking cooler than I. You did. And everyone's Absolutely. talked about that. Was that the eyes, the ears, the stutter? Was that everything that everyone's touched on the fact, yes, the stuttering was predominant, but you had so much going on, it was easy to be the target. Again, this is the cruelty of me. Yeah. And stepping stone is a really frightening concept. It probably applies. Yes, it does. <laughs> I mean, that's how I felt. I mean, again, we're best friends. We're hanging out. At the same time, in a minute, you could turn and cut me like a life. And no one else in the world could. Why was that, do you think? Well, what, what was that I'm, about? I'm fundamentally an asshole. <laughs> But you've known since we were five. And my parents didn't understand. 
They just didn't understand what to do. How what did they say it. to you? Let's go back. What did they say to you when you Suck came home in tears? Suck it up. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. They're just like, you know, they just don't understand. Um, I was punched. I was spit on. I was wedged. I, I mean, everything you can imagine happened to me. Um, what would you, what would you have rather in retrospect, what would you have rather, or if you had a child that you were helping through that same time, what would you rather they said to you? Literally sit down and listen and literally say, okay, I know this is rough. I really understand you want your friends and you want people to appreciate you. You want to be confident. And I'm sorry that it's not that way, but we're here for you. We believe in you. We love you. Uh, early on, my family knew that I wanted to be a broadcaster. Early on, they knew my love of media and listen to Cubs baseball. I talk about that story all the time. But right. my parents said, it's never going to happen. Ah. Uh. I so identify with that as well. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you get to a point with that messaging that you said, oh, yeah, watch me? There was someone of the defy the odds mental atoms. I dare yeah. you to tell me one more time. There, there was part of that. And you and I both have a very strong faith. The faith was the other cure. Then my belief in God, the help from God, um, did something miraculous that nothing else ever could have happened. I totally credit God stepping in and reshaping what I get to do today. Awesome. So was there a moment, was there a turning point where you, maybe it was a day that you were struggling a lot and then all of a sudden something clicked and you went, I can do this. <laughs> there, were, there were two actually. Uh, I was dating a gal in high school and she totally understand my stutter and everything else. And I had a big surprise date plan and I was extra nervous and tongue tied. And she sat there looking at me and said, and then finally she just cut me off and says, look, relax. You know, I'm going to say, yes, I know you've gotten some secret plan. Just relax. I already am going to say, yes, believe it. And it was kind of like, wow, I'm okay. She's okay with it. So Did it help? Relax. Oh, it, it, it totally changed the idea of me just embracing it to me say, okay, who, they're okay with it. I'm okay with it. The other one really was 10 weeks. I signed up for a drama team with a Christian organization. And I was going to be acting as a Roman soldier, the big bad Roman soldier all summer long for 10 weeks. And I was blowing it all week long, all week long, final preparation. We met for the final dress rehearsal and it was in front of a live audience. We met backstage. They huddled up and they said, here's the deal. Rich hasn't done this all week long. It's been a disaster. We all know it. If Rich cannot hit it tonight, we have to pull this back, and you guys can travel for 10 weeks doing puppets. No pressure at all. No pressure yeah, at right? all on Rich, right? We prayed. We huddled up. We walked out, and I hit every mark, every line, every cue, every attitude. And I could see my actors. Their eyes were getting bigger. We went through it saying, when's he going to blow? When's he going to blow? And we got to the back, and they huddled up. The, the director's almost crying, and she goes, it's a mute point. God just showed up. God wants you to go do it. Go. And we did it all summer long. And that was the biggest turning point because guess who became the speaker, the fill-in pastor, the fill-in interview guy that every radio station uh, talked to throughout the 10 weeks? You. The guy that stuttered. So and it completely changed. The moment that you went from the rehearsals, though, to the live show where you said no pressure, right? That's intense pressure. Oh gosh, yes. So what do you think, like, was it just a God thing or was I, there something that absolutely went, okay, I found my group? Uh, mm -hmm. A, God thing, 110%. I, I will never deny that he literally grabbed and took over. Second was, I really did step in and become the character. And Bruce Willis, yeah. who stutters, talks about, Becoming that character, the other person has helped him to get around his stutter for years and years and years. Yeah. So I literally was in the moment. I was a bad soldier. I was going to come up to them. And I was, um, and partly what I get to do now through everything I get to do as media interviewer, sportscaster, I get to play a role. Yeah. So the very first time that I remember just being utterly shocked was the uh, day I came out to visit you. I think you were in Iowa. And we did a basketball game together. 
and how impressed I was with how well you did it. And you probably remember I couldn't get two words out the whole time. <laughs> Talk about turning tables. But I, oh man, I just remember going, this is not my brother. What This is incredible. How is he doing this? So the time when we came to Minnesota, to Rochester, to see you speak in the, uh, well, to see you uh, lead worship in the church there, one with the coffee shop that you were putting in and all yeah. that. Yep. I remember, uh, you know, being so amazingly impressed and we all did that day. Um, and the reason why, especially I was so impressed was because, all right, so a few years before that, I'd been impressed by you being on the radio, but now here you were standing up in front of a large group of people, okay, and doing it again in person. And I remembered for the first time going, for sure, he chose the right path. There is an entertainment acting part of what I do every day, and learning that cadence, learning how to do that has unlocked a ton. But in the middle of it all is my tongue does not work the way it's supposed to. And the only reason it does is God. Now I, I have learned techniques. Sure. My brain speed and my mouth speed used to be out of sync. Right. When right. I figured to put the rate of information to the rate of output at the right speed, that helped immensely. So I'm not tripping over. I got to get everything out right away, Sonder. I've got to tell you everything right now. And be like, <laughs> and then we start fighting. <laughs> when I figured out how to do that, that was the other big game changer. That's, that's cool. Now, somebody in my research, tell me what you think of this. Uh, just, just curious, because if anybody is dealing with this, right, or their kiddos are dealing with it, you're going to go and you're going to Google things and it's going to come up and you're probably going to find different techniques and things. So one of the gentlemen that I was researching said, you know what? He goes, if you're dealing with this, he goes, the, the pressure is coming from looking in somebody's eyes. Start. Don't stay there. But the first step is to look away from their eyes and say three times in your mind what you're going to say and then say it. Is that of any value? It may be for some people. For me, it's a completely opposite way. What I've learned is I have to go first. So I would want to ask the girl out, hang out with my friends, meet somebody new. And I would wait so I could figure out how I was going to answer them. And it would make my tongue get more tied. I now go first. Almost every time I meet somebody new, I'll go, hi, I'm Rich. I'm Trigger. Nice to meet you. Put out my hand, look them in the eye, and they have to go second. And somehow by me going first, it allows me to just go at whatever is going to come out, and it's going to come out, and I'm okay with it. The other way is I've got to think now what, what I'm going to say. Right. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. So, I mean, the point that I see here is that it's different for every person. Yes. There, there is no, no play by playbook to fix this. Right. Right. There's no, there's no, like you said, there's no playbook. There's no rules no. of play here. It's just whatever works. Everyone is an individual and that's part of understanding stutters. You can't say, well, it's this, it's that, it's that. Now, they do have family dynamics and other things that come into it. That, yeah. Those are generalizations. You actually, you have a talk that you do on this, right? Stutter yeah. to stage. Yeah. So tell me, tell me a little bit about that. What's, what give me one takeaway from your talk that, that you share with audiences? You know, probably one of the biggest takeaways really is the idea of relax. Um, the other one is laugh at yourself. Uh, I found something that if I was able to laugh at myself, not down at myself, this is not self-deprecating, beat yourself up. This was if, if I blew it on stage, which I do, literally I invite the crowd because the crowd will grab their armchairs, they'll fold their back body and close off and not listen anymore. They can, here comes a train wreck. And so I get to go, <laughs> that was my stutter. That's, that's me. Uh, now, Take two. And people laugh. They chuckle. Sometimes they'll go. Bleh, 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 bleh. But if I can lighten the mood for other people, yeah. it lightens the mood for everybody. But that's on me. I have to set that. And so one of the things I encourage people to do is don't take themselves so serious. I speak on very serious things sometimes, but I don't take myself serious. I have to have fun doing this. Well, and the other thing is my imagination, as I said. Um, growing up, I did talk to my army men. I talked to Superman and Batman, my action figures. I would line them up and I would talk to them in the basement and give them lectures and sermons. 
I had totally forgot about this. I had totally forgot about this, Sandra, until seven years ago. My parents brought it up and said, you've always been speaking to the crowd. And I said, what? He said, don't you remember? And then also it was like this flash of memory came back. I'm in my basement with my toys all standing up. And I did have a mini pulpit, a little lectern that I built. And I was standing there doing it as a little five, eight, ten year old. And I'm like, holy cow. Oh my God. That's how embedded this was. This is in my life. Yeah. And now I get to help other people. Now I get to use the platform I've been given right. to shine a light on this and pull back the veil and say, hey, here it is. And I'm not alone. You're not alone. But it's become one of the brand markers of what I get to do. I do not hide this in any way, shape, or form. In fact, when I get introduced on stage, the final ending of when I go on live on stage, the announcer will read my pre-written words. The guy that stutters for a living is here to help you rock the stage and learn how to speak better. Welcome to Trigger. <laughs> and yes, I get laughs. I get people cringing. They don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you've actually created some levity around it. You're making an impact. You're changing people. Uh, people's lives that maybe feel like something that can hold them back. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right out there encouraging people to just, just do it. So we've had our way with the ups and downs, the pain, the losses of stuttering, but we've all made it. We've all learned to manage it and conquer it in some way. It's never cured, but we've found ways to manage our stutter. As we go back into beyond the stutter tonight, we're getting some tips and tricks from those that have gathered here to talk about their stutter. Can you give any tips for people to help them that are maybe at that point of get some serious help, keep doing it myself? What would you say to someone who's at that point where like you were? Well, I think, you know, as we've gone through this journey of doing it for ourselves and seeing the others like yourself come, come through this, we're realizing more and more that it actually is an emotional limitation. Uh, majority of the times, it's not really a physical disability. And there are, there are some people with it, for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't want to discount that at all. But the majority of the conversations that we're having with people, it is a emotional limitation, a trauma that's happened in the past that's causing this. My advice to people is this. Think about, allow yourself to know that you can get through this. You deserve it. You're worth it. Yeah. And uh, there are people like myself and yourselves out there to help. Yeah. It's, it's a transformational shift. And when we talk about transformation, six shifts have to occur. One, your mindset. Two, lifestyle. Three, habit shift. Four, identity shift. Then there's a shift in your superpower, your special power. In this case, stuttering became my superpower. And the last one, you got to upgrade your tools. The tools of the trade improve your speaking so in as much as you stutter let's take stutter and put it aside you still have to grow as a person you still have to build a lot a lot of other things but th those are the six transformational shifts that have to occur and but the most important is the mindset that i started to use stuttering as my superpower Everybody watching, listening, replaying, you just got schooled on transformation from a guy that stutters, <laughs> which is which is a great thing about this. When we're in our zone, when we're in that space of genius, this disappears and we just flow, don't we? As the years got got um, went on, um, my sister, she found a free community sort of um, program. Mm -hmm. where there were uh, students, speech pathology students, running a new type of class. Wow. Now, it was, they split up the group into two. I was one of them. Um, one into, they added CBT, which is cognitive behavior therapy. Okay. They added speech pathology to CBT, and then they had a control, which was just normal speech pathology. And I think at this point, I think it was the first experience where I opened up into looking inside myself. So this university wanted to run this experiment to see how it was and how it affected stutterers. And when I went in through this class, it was a big eye opener because it really affected me in a positive way. Wow. And as the years went on, I started to have this, you know, that this really helped. And 
I totally forgot about it because I was probably about 20, 20 or 21. Um, but I still had the stutter. And as the years went on, I was doing more of this uh, inner journey, looking into my subconscious, looking within myself. And I started to untangle that when I, when I have more confidence, when I am most confident within myself, mm-hmm. I don't stutter. And I started to untangle this inner fear that I had felt as a child because when I came as a child, we escaped persecution. So I had a lot of trauma that I didn't even know that I had that affected my stutter and just stuck. So when I started to unravel and detangle this fear, this subconscious fear that I had running within me, mm-hmm. it was like everything else fell apart. I started not to eat as much. I started to understand my anxiety. My anxiety was not even there anymore. It was like the root cause of what was holding me back. You're launching a YouTube channel to help people I learn am. about stuttering. Are you insane? <laughs> I'm crazy, man. <laughs> I'm really trying to just get 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 myself out there. Speaking of, that's one of my techniques. So if I do get stuck, I I'll slow up the words at the start. So y'all watch out for that. <laughs> That's a key. Um, but no, and and it's 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 great to hear that because most people don't know what we do. Mm-hmm. I, I talk about cutting and splicing my sentences when I'm talking. Uh-huh. I, I talk about the speed of the information here coming out of here and balancing out the speed rate. Yeah. But that's a great tip that people have to understand. We all do something different, but yours is slow it down mm-hmm. and work it out, right? Yeah, slow it down and work it out. One of the most amazing things is eventually. You find freedom from your stutter. Now, that doesn't mean that your stutter goes away. That's far from true very often. Your stutter is with you. It's a part of you. And often we fight and we resist that so often, especially when we're young. We think there's no hope. And then we find freedom. We come to the point of embracing our stutter as a part of us. And in fact, yes, celebrating I stutter. Let's go back with our guests tonight and let's hear some of their freedom stories as we go beyond the stutter once again. Was there friend support, uh, teacher support? Did you have someone come alongside you and say, look, I get it. The speech thing is a struggle, but there's other things in you. I see in you. Did you have anyone come alongside and do that? Yeah, I've had two people who did that to me. One was my grade nine English teacher, Miss Tomic. I remember her. And uh, we were reading The Outsiders at that point. And she just kept me aside, kept me after school, taught me and worked with me and showed me hope. So that kind of got me through grade nine, grade 10. Then there was a gentleman when I was 16 or 17. I remember lying on my sofa. He knocked on my door. My mom had told him that I'm just sitting at home doing nothing all day. He knocked on my door. I opened the door and he basically says, you know, he says, get the off the sofa and get your shit together. This is not going to work. Wow. And I'm looking at him and he was a successful realtor at that point. Yeah. I'm looking at him. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you've got more to offer than this. You can't do this anymore. And that's kind of when I changed. That's when I kind kind of leaned into myself and said, okay, this is silly. I need to do something for myself. I did a lot of personal growth and development work Mm -hmm. the last 10 years to figure this out. And my turning point was, when I realized where the stutter came from, when I pinpointed the moment of that great 10 experience, I was actually able to let it go. And I don't think I've stuttered so far today. I, it does come back once in a while. Yes. But not normally. How, how afraid of you were you before you did the TEDx? What was it like moments when they said, you're wrong? What were you like backstage? Um. So I was afraid when someone approached me saying, hey, Karim, I really like what your message is. Uh, how would you like to talk about it on, you know, on the big stage? And I'm thinking, I don't think this guy knows who I am. I don't think he understands that I'm not a speaker. You know, I'm a stutterer. Like he doesn't know me, right? Like I'm not, I'm not good enough type of thing. And from that moment until I went on stage was 12 months. Okay. 
So for 12 months, I had breathing and practicing this talk. And for 12 months, I was heavily nervous. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and after it was all over, I had this sense of confidence that I could. And after that, it was like my stutter just just flicked. So that's been a common theme this week. There comes a point when you embrace yourself. Mm -hmm. What made you do that? What, what made you finally get to the point and say, this is who I am. I'm cool with it. Mm -hmm. And everyone else has got to be cool with it too. When did you get to that point? My past birthday in April. I just turned... <laughs> 30 and it was a a real come to Jesus moment like Lord you made me like this and your word says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made so I just I'm trying to hold on to that as much as I can no matter what anybody says no matter what I think about myself no matter how down that I may get about my speech you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, there you have it. We've gone beyond the stutter tonight. We looked at the family, the friends, some of the issues that stutters struggle with, and some of the great successes that stutters have as well. But for a moment, as we wind down, I want to talk to you, the individual that may bump into a stutter and you have no idea what to do. What's some of the things that I can do, Trigger, to help somebody else? First of all, just relax. If someone stutters, don't fill in the words for them. Let them take the time and work through it. They have something to say to you, and it's important that they say it in their words. Stuttering is not necessarily a psychological problem. It's something that has many different triggers, as we've heard about tonight. Don't think you understand what's going on. You probably don't. Stuttering, by the way, is not a brain injury. And they're highly intelligent, smart people that stutter. It's just something from here to here that doesn't work right. And stuttering. It may make you more anxious than the person who's actually stuttering. Think about that for a minute. We get nervous very easily in awkward situations. Relax. It will help you just relate to them naturally and have a great conversation. Special thanks tonight to Sandra D. Robinson for joining us and going in depth on my stutter and my family. We have never done that in our entire life, actually reflect on our journey. I thank you for giving us the time to do that. And I thank you to all of our other guests from around the world tonight that have shared their story with you beyond the stutter. We'll be back next year to do this once again as we continue to learn what stuttering is but stuttering's not how you can shine bright, even if you have a study. That's going to do it for tonight. I'm the Trigger Rich Bond Trigger. Have a great evening. And the last words I would have for people is that you do deserve it. There is hope. Allow yourself to feel it and get through it. And reach out. Reach out to people like ourselves and, and talk to them and hear our stories. If you could go back in time and talk to the younger version of yourself, the overweight, stutter, inner stutter, trapped. What would you say to them if you, if you go back and say? I would say that you need to be here. You need to go through these trenches. Because these are the life skills that you would learn. In these times, you will become stronger. And it will all be worth it when you're older. You will understand why life is doing this for you, not against you.